Hi, and welcome to the second tutorial series on Z-Vector. In this tutorial series, we'll be talking about topics such as input coloring and parameters, tracking, input filtering, using the mirror mode, controlling the input center, controlling the virtual camera, as well as ca doing camera and controller smoothing. Just as I, I did in the introductory tutorial, I'd like to point out that you can find the written and illustrated versions of these tutorials on our user forum. Now let's get started. Hello and welcome to the first part of this tutorial series. In this part, we'll be talking about input coloring and input parameters. Before we do anything, let's open up an open uh, rendering window so that we can see what we're doing. I'll also up the count a little bit and change the surfaces. Z-Vector has five different input color modes. I'll go through, through them from top to bottom. They are no color, intensity or grayscale, inverted RGB, RGB and generated grayscale. Pressing any of the corresponding buttons will activate that mode. And if you were running a second input, you would control the mode for that input over here. Now we went through the through the, the same example in the introductory tutorial, but let's do it again. So I'll I'll just pick the RGB mode here, maneuver over the controls, I'll go to the gradient, I'll pick the intensity as my mode, and then I'll just start to recolor the image. with the fill slider. Now I can do the same in any of the other modes. So let's try generate grayscale, for example. And let's pick another color. I'll just change the scale a little bit. Now a few more things. Uh, below the coloring modes there are two buttons. There's the link button, which essentially links input one and two together. So then you're controlling many of the things simultaneously as you control one of them. And then you have the rec button, which actually starts the RGBD recording for that particular input. Or if you were under linked mode, you would start it for, for both both input one and two simultaneously. Now let's move forward. Welcome to the second part of this tutorial series. This part covers topics such as tracking, input filtering and the mirror mode. The space right over the input contains controls for some of the most interesting features of Z-Vector. From left to right they are mirror mode, automatic input center tracking, background filtering based on depth, automatic human form filtering or auto filter, which is only available for certain sensor types. Mirror mode does what it promises. It flips the image horizontally. This could be useful to you in some use cases. For example, if, if you were doing a background projection at an event. Automatic input center tracking calculates the input cent input's camera center based on the available depth data and places the virtual camera's pivot point in that place. This might or might not be useful to you, depending on the case and the sensor type used. Depth-based background filtering makes it possible for you to take a sample that will be used to filter out any consecutive data following that particular sample. 
This can be useful depending on the use case. For example, uh, if you take the sample prior to people entering the dance floor or the performer entering the stage, the sample is automatically taken when the mode is first activated, but it can, it can be recreated at any point by shift clicking on the icon. I'll just take a sample right now and remove myself from the image prior to doing so. Now, as you can see, I, the background is filtered out, but I remain in the image. Automatic human form detection or auto filtering can be used to alg algorithmically detect, separate and mask humanoid forms in and out of the image in real time. It's important to note that this mode is only available on particular sensor types. In order to demonstrate how this mode works, I will start one of the RGPD samples that come with the software. I can do so from here, from the trigger section. Now let's move on with the tutorial series. Welcome to the third part of this tutorial series. In this part, we'll be talking about the input center. The input center defines the Z vector's camera's center of rotation when the input mixer, that is the Z mixer here, is set to show only one input. This is important. If the input mixer is anywhere but the very ends of the controller, so either at 1 is 100 or 100, the resulting input center will be a mix of mix between the locations of each input center. In layered and side-by-side -side input modes, you can move the input freely by clicking the input preview with the left mouse button. So let's say that I would like to, for example, focus on my face. I will just click left click on my face. And I will have my camera center, center of rotation at that point and at that depth. You can reset the input center by right-clicking the input preview. So if I right-click on this area here, it will reset, reset the input center, like that. Uh, another pointer here uh, that I would like to point out is that if you are automatically tracking a person, uh, for example, if I click myself now, uh, as, as you can see, I've been highlighted in blue color, which means that, that the automatic human form detection algorithm has detected that I'm a person and is offering me the chance to mask out the background automatically. If I alt-click myself, I will be automatically then tracked the input center is now locked to the center line of my person and at, at the ap approximate height of the click. And when the so center is locked like this, if I use my touchpad or if I was using a mouse, I would use the roller, uh, I can actually then keep, the, keep myself tracked but move, my, move uh, up and down on my own person. This might be useful if you're kind of trying to find the perfect position for your camera. Let's continue on with the tutorials. Welcome to the fourth part of this tutorial series. In this part, we'll be talking about controlling the virtual camera. The fact that the depth sensor is capable of capturing the distance of each pixel relative to the sensor device enables a feature that we've come to call the virtual camera. Clicking on the Edit A or Edit B button, it will be named according to the profile that is active. So for me it's Edit A. This will ex expose the camera controls for the virtual camera. 
From here, I can control the camera's yaw, pitch, roll, zoom, and field of view, and animate, even animate them if I'd like to do so. Out of these, two sets of controllers are provided for yaw, pitch, and roll. Slider-based animation ready velocity controllers, as well as knob type absolute value controllers. The two types of controllers can be mapped separately for more control over the camera. We'll cover mapping in a later tutorial. The currently active camera parameters are always saved along with the visual profile. For more predefined control in live situations, for example, if you'd like to catch a detail on a performance upper body or face, four global camera slots are also offered. These are here. The four numbered slots will override any camera settings that come with the profile. This can be useful, for example, if you'd like to keep the camera on continuous rotation and keep the same camera movement going even as you switch between different profiles. Shift left clicking on any of the four slots will save the current camera parameters as a global preset under that slot. Left clicking the slot without pressing shift will then load the saved preset. Prior to moving to the next part in the tutorial series, let's save two camera presets. Open and edit your camera controls. So I've opened them. First, define an input center that you'd like to focus on from your input by left clicking on a part of it. So for example, I'm being automatically still tracked by the way. But if I would like to, for example, focus to focus on my face, I will just left click it like that. And now as I start to edit these camera controls, the center pivoting point of the camera will stick to my face or wherever, wherever my face was at that particular time. So if I move my face away, I'm not being tracked. And then I will just do a little bit of zoom, I'll get a closer detail of my face, and then save that as a preset here. And then I'll create another one, and I'll do a little bit less zoom, just use a little bit more field of view. I'll stop the camera there, and create an angle, and then save there. So now I can switch between these two cameras. Let's move on to the next tutorial. Welcome to the fifth and final part of this tutorial series. In this part we'll be talking about camera and controller smoothing. Control smoothing adjusts the smoothing of parameter changes for the input and control tabs. Camera smoothing does the same for camera controls. A high smoothing value can prolong the interesting transitional effects that take place during profile changes. A small smoothing value, on the other hand, can be useful if you're trying to avoid jerky changes in the visualization caused by, for example, an une uneven mouse or MIDI controller motion. Let's first see how the camera transitions work without smoothing. So I'll just click between the two slots that I saved in the previous part of this tutorial series. Now I'll try to apply some smoothing and then do the same. Now it's much smoother, but you can see that there's still a kind of a jerk in between these two camera modes. Now this is because I'm mixing the, the two types of controllers. So I'm mixing the velocity type controllers with the global position type controllers. So I'll just go back to editing profile, camera profile one, and set, it, set the yaw to, from the, for the velocity controller to zero. And then I'll just shift, shift left click on, on slot number one again. So I'm saving, resaving the camera to that particular position. And then I'll try to click between the, the slots again. And as you can see, I'm 
having a completely smooth transition between the two, two positions. Let's move on to control smoothing. Controller smoothing works quite similarly to the camera smoothing, even though the end results from the point of view of the rendered visuals can be very different. We'll try a simple experiment. Let's go to live mode, just for the sake of, of saving some GPU cycles. And then we'll switch between some of the preset profiles that we have here. So I'll switch between, I'll click on Firewalk, for example. That's me still there. Hello. And then I'll click on Lightning. And now, as you can see, the, there's no transitional effect between these two clicks. So then I'll set some controller smoothing, and I'll do the same. Now, as you can see, there's a kind of a smooth transition between these visuals. Now, was my frame rate a little bit higher, you would see a much nicer effect here, but, but you get the point. Now, let's next try to do the same on some controllers. We'll go to controls. I'll just set the effects off here in order to save some GPU cycles. And then what we'll do is, is we'll first set the controls to zero, and then I'll just move the count slider here, up and down. And as you can see, the effect is immediate. Now, if I apply some controller smoothing here, the effect is not applied immediately. Uh, there's a kind of a wait before the effect goes either up or down. So I'm smoothing the value now. And you can change the, change the smoothing values and uh, just experiment with them in order for you to get a clue how they work. Now it's important to note that smoothing, neither camera or controller smoothing, is never applied to animation driven by sound or beat input. It's, on the other hand, applied to incoming MIDI or OSC. So that's just a pointer. Congratulations, you've just completed the second video tutorial series. I hope to see you in the next one.